was saying what I heard. But I can tell you now what I know. I know him for myself. I know he's a way maker. I know he's a burden bearer. I know he'll dry tears from your eyes. First, giving honor to God, our pastor, and all of the ministers of the gospel, and all of you that come to worship at this hour. First, I thank God for another day, a day that we neither earned nor deserved. A lot of folk get up in the morning like God owed them another day or like they did something to earn another day. But I don't care how saved you are. I don't care how holy you look to us. I don't care how pious you try to appear. All of us have done enough wrong that any night we sleep, if God just checked the record, None of us would see the next moment. So every day is a gift from God. A lot of my friends be checking the weather channel, watching the news, trying to figure out if tomorrow is going to be a good day. But every day is a good day to me. Could be a good hot day, good cold day, good rainy day, good dry day, good cloudy day, good clear day. Don't matter to me, every day above ground is a good day. Because every day I get up, I realize that somehow while I slept, a divine decision was made to look beyond my faults and supply my needs. I realize if it had been left up to my enemies, I wouldn't have got up this morning. But I thank God he reserves that decision all by himself. So you can sit there and be cool and sophisticated and polished, but I thank him because he gave me what he didn't owe me. Then I'm happy to be here at Brentwood again, and certainly in no small measure because of my regard and respect for one of the great theological preaching minds of our time, Reverend Joe Ratliff. The Bible say you judge a tree by the fruit it bears. We judge a tree by the bark it wears. But I've found a lot of trees look good, don't bear no fruit. But you can't go anywhere in Christendom that does not know Joe Ratliff and that have not been taught and mentored and nurtured by him all over the world. When you mention him, people can give you, particularly those women and men in the ministry, can give you personal Joe Ratliff stories of what he has meant to them and their ministry. And sometimes we take for granted things that's close to us. But you ought not take for granted the great man you have pastor in this church. He and I have had, as he said, we've been friends down through the years so much so he don't even call me no more 
to book me, he just tells me. <laughs> he called me a couple months ago and said, what you doing on whatever yesterday's date was? I told him, he said, that's nice, because you're going to be doing the breakfast at Brentwood, <laughs> and then you're going to spend the night and preach. <laughs> and that's how he is. It don't matter what you thought you was doing. <laughs> when Ratliff calls, you come. <laughs> because he's earned that kind of respect. Then I'm happy, uh, I, I told the men yesterday, one of the things that you learn in life is you thank God for those that invest in you and those that have taken time with you, they didn't have to. And I was blessed in life though, I came from a single parent home at a young age. I met a man who became like a father to me that you knew as the uh, godfather soul, James Brown. And he kind of adopted and raised me. And his manager, who was there when I met him, when I was in my teens, uh, was like my uncle all through those years. And in his later years, he used to tell his manager, he said, if anything ever happens to me, I want you to always look out for my children and rub them shout. <laughs> so that night, uh, Christmas morning, 2006, his manager called me. He was sitting in the room, James Brown had just died. I was the second call he made. And I went down and uh, did the funerals. And I remember the last funeral, I said to him, I said, well, what you gonna do now? You've been on the road 43 years, 40 years with James Brown and three years with Michael Jackson. I said, what you gonna do now? He said, well, I'm 70 something years old. He said, I guess I'm gonna learn how to go home and be a household husband and father. I ain't never been home like that. I said, well, I thought Mr. Brown told you to take care of me and his kids. He said, he did. I said, well, you keep your bags packed. You're going to stay on the road and take care of me. <laughs> and almost four years now since James Brown's death, he's been with me on the road. He's 80 years old now. But he's on the road with me, with me this morning, Brother Charles Bobby. And he takes care of me just like he did Mr. Brown. I told him yesterday, uh, everywhere I go, he won't let me carry a bag and won't let me do nothing. And get in the airport, he gets the bags, he gets the briefcase. So I just throw my head back, walk through like I'm Joe Ratliff or somebody. <laughs> Let me turn your attention to the book of Joshua. First chapter. Joshua, first chapter, beginning at the first verse. It reads, after the death of Moses, the Lord's servant, the Lord spoke to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' assistant. He said, now that my servant Moses is dead, you must lead my people across the Jordan into to the land I'm giving thee. I promise you what I promised Moses. Everywhere you go, you will be on land I have given you. Then I want to end on the fifth verse. He, no one will be able to stand their ground against you as long as you live. For I will be with you as I was with Moses. I will not fail you or abandon you. I want to use for thought this morning God's promise. God's promise. Today is the anniversary of what is known in American civil rights history as Bloody Sunday. In 1965, two civil rights leaders led a couple of hundred people across the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma. One named Hosea Williams, who was then a field director for Dr. Martin Luther King, and one John Lewis, who at that time was the head of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. He's now a member of Congress. And they were met by Alabama state troopers and beaten on that bridge. 
because they were leading a march from Selma to Montgomery to get blacks the right to vote. That beating brought national attention and Martin Luther King himself ended up coming to Selma and lead, led what became a historic march from Selma to Montgomery and the drama from that march led to the Voting Rights Act of 1965 and made it possible for all of us to be able to vote. Every year, including this year in the afternoon, many of us that were too young and many that weren't born joined those that were there and reenact that march across the bridge. Four years ago, Dr. Ratcliffe, I was there and the speaker, I call him Radcliffe, it's Radcliffe. The speaker that year, Radcliffe, was a senator. A senator from Illinois, named Barack Obama. And I never forget that then Senator Obama got up at Brown Chapel and his message was that the generation that had led us across that bridge was the Moses generation. And that those of us that were out here now was the Joshua generation. Well, I thought about that. And I talked to him later about it and I've talked to him even now since he's been president. I say, you know, if we are the Joshua generation, because he says that Dr. King and Andy Young and Jesse Jackson, all of them were the most generation, those of us that are a little younger, the Joshua generation. I said, well, if we're the Joshua generation, then we at least ought to know who Joshua was. <laughs> a lot of y'all run around using slogans and never analyze what you talking about. I read all this stuff, this the Joshua generation by folks that don't know who and what Joshua was. First of all, I, I look when I come into Brentwood and there shows the pastors that led up to now. And many of us just act like that that's just some photos, never understanding that anything that God has anything to do with has continuity. And this whole thing of fighting from one generation to another is not God. There is a continuation from one generation to another. What do I mean by that? Joshua was not the one to confront Moses. He was the continuation of Moses. A lot of y'all think to set yourself up, you got to fight those ahead of you. What you need to do is be connected so you can continue and embellish those that were ahead of you. So when you look at Brentwood from the beginning, pastor showed me someone who said that we used to meet the church, used to meet in our house. Well, if you look from where it started, and look at now where Ratliff is brought. That is one straight line. That's not a conflict. You don't need a revolution every generation. And that is why the first verse in the first chapter of Joshua showed you, first of all, Joshua was a continuation of Moses. Said he was Moses' assistant. I mean, he wasn't against Moses. He was up under Moses. He came out of Moses' movement. One of the reasons we have so many problems today, I was teasing Pastor Radcliffe yesterday that he, when he invited me, I didn't know what was going to be going on. But with the week we had in New York, I was glad to get to Houston. <laughs> with all the mess we got with the governor and Wrangell, I was ready to leave earlier than the flight he had. I wouldn't know if he had something to do Friday night. I'd have got down here. <laughs> but one of the reasons that we're having problems with some black leaders is because some folk that have gotten there didn't come out of the movement that sponsored them. 
some of y'all sitting up here today working in good jobs, living in wonderful areas, driving nice cars, like you got there by yourself. When Moses had come to Pharaoh and God used them to put seven plagues on Egypt land, which led to the freedom and the exodus of the slave. The last of the plagues was a Passover and the death angel was unleashed and the death angel took the firstborn in every household that didn't have the blood of the lamb on the doorpost. A lot of folk put blood on doorposts because they believed or they wanted to spare those in the house that believed. But everybody that was in the house that got spared didn't believe in the blood. And you got a lot of Negroes that enjoyed the exodus but didn't believe in the blood that brought them out of Egypt in the first place. Just cause you got spared didn't mean you believed in the blood. You just got lucked up that you was in a house that some of us put our blood on the door to spare you. I was debating one night on one of these channels. Black conservative, he said, Red Mal, I don't believe in all this civil rights stuff, all this marching, protesting y'all do. I don't believe in that. Look at me, I'm established, I'm prosperous, I'm successful. Look at my resume. I went to the best schools. I'm a member of the right fraternities. I'm a member of the right sororities. I'm a member of the right country club. Look at my resume. Civil rights didn't write my resume. I told him, you right. Civil rights didn't write your resume. But civil rights made somebody read your resume. You ain't the first qualified Negro in America. <laughs> They're Negroes qualified before you, but they didn't have the opportunity you had. And don't you ever forget some unleaded, uneducated, non-college black grandmamas laid down in Birmingham and Selma so you could have a chance. You look down your nose at those that sponsored you in the first place. Wasn't nothing wrong with us, it was something wrong with America. Blacks could play baseball before Jackie Robinson. We had to get America ready, we was already ready. Blacks could be president before 2008. Wasn't that we wasn't ready, America wasn't ready. Don't turn your back on those that made it possible for you to get where you are. So God brought them, God delivered them. They got out in, to the banks of the Red Sea. And even then, God created a way out of nowhere. God opened up the Red Sea, gave a dry highway. Children of Israel walked through. And even then they doubted God. They looked around and saw Pharaoh's chariots coming and said, look at this, we're going to die. And God clapped his hands, drowned Pharaoh's army. You'd have thought after all of that, they would never turn their back on God. But they got out in the wilderness and started building golden calves and worshiping golden trinkets and worshiping materialism, doing the bling bling out in the wilderness. Just like us, they fell apart with just a little progress. Some of us just got a little bit and forgot the God we knew. When you didn't have a job and you didn't have a new car, you was at Bible class, choir rehearsal, and church all day Sunday. But now you got a new car and a nice house and a little title on your business card. And you go to church when you're not golfing. You show up if the weather's all right. 
You've got to schedule time for God. But you better learn how to get up in the morning and get on your knees before God do something to knock you to your knees. Moses went on as far as he could. His anger led him to rebuke them. Mr. Promised Land and God brought on Joshua to continue the journey. Joshua dealing with people who had been stubborn, just like we got now. Look at where we are, and then look at us. I told the men, the culture doesn't reflect where we are. We were singing classics and singing opera and singing gospel when we were on the back of the bus. Now we're in the White House, and we cussing each other out in our music calling our women out the name. I remember three, four years ago, we started to move in Nash Action Network, NAACP, many of us saying, let's bury the N-word. Let's quit calling each other the N-word because you cannot have our children growing up looking at themselves as less than what they are. And some of my friends in the hip hop community got mad at me and said, we going to call ourselves what we want. We got freedom of speech. I said, no, you don't. They said, what do you mean? I said, if you go in a studio and cut a CD and call Irish out their name, they call it hate speech, and they write, and they won't put it out. Call Jews out their name, hate speech, won't put it out. Call gays out their name, hate speech, and they won't put it out. So let me get this right. You say something about Irish, hate speech. Jews, hate speech. Gays, hate speech. Call blacks, niggas, free speech. <laughs> you only have the freedom to call yourself a name. We got on BET one night, had a debate. And I debated one of the rappers all night long, Ratliff, he just had a, what I call a nigger fit, just niggered me to death. <laughs> Everything I said, he was nigger, 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 nigger. <laughs> and I kept telling him, we can't do that to our children. We must tell them who they are in their history. He just kept niggering me. <laughs> About seven, eight weeks later, I was somewhere on the road and I picked up the newspaper that morning. He'd been arrested. <laughs> Found him with something and he'd been arrested. Three or four days later, they called me from Nash Action Network in Harlem, said this rapper was on the phone. I said, well, connect them in. They patched him through to me on my cell phone. I said, how you doing? He said, I'm not doing too good. I said, what happened? He said, I got busted. I said, yeah, I read about it. What, what happened? Yeah, they set me up and bust me. I said, well, what you need me to do? He said, I need your help. I said, you need my help to do what? He said, they violated my civil rights. <laughs> I told them niggas ain't got no civil rights. you define yourself is how you confine yourself. Joshua became the leader. God made a promise. God said, Joshua, I'm going to tell you one thing. He said, I'm not going to even, I'm not even going to use a whole lot of time. Notice it was all in one verse. It wasn't a whole lot of chapters. He said, as I was with Moses, so shall I be with you. I won't abandon you and I won't leave you. And that was it. The reason why he didn't have to explain a lot to Joshua, that's why I took the time to tell you who Joshua was, is Joshua knew what he did for Moses because he was there. Had he just got some young guy, a young lady that was new, he would have had to break them in and break it down and explain it. But if you grow up in the way, 
God ain't got to do a whole lot of explaining. God just said, as I was with Moses. You were there when I opened up the Red Sea. You were there when I brought down the seven plagues. You watched all of the people turn on Moses and I held them up just like I was with him. I'll be with you. He never promised that the folks would be with him. He never promised his friends would be with him. He never promised his family would be with him. He never promised they wouldn't lie on him and wouldn't have rumors out and wouldn't go for everything they put out. I didn't promise you that. I promise you that through all of that, as I was with Moses, when everybody's gone, when your family turned their back, I won't abandon you. You know, I, I, I travel a lot. Mr. Bobby, to tell you, I go no matter what the situation. Good days, bad days, storms, don't matter to me. If I got to go, I go. The only thing right there will make me not get on the plane is when they tell me it's the pilot's first trip. They be explaining to me, Reverend, you ain't got to worry about that. He been to pilot school, got his license, been certified, tested, all that. I got all that. But just something about going up there. First time he in charge. And he may hit a cloud and can't see where he going and all the radars on him for the first time. I don't want to be up there for the first time. Or he may hit some turbulence and he ain't never been the captain before. When the plane starts shaking, I just don't want to be there the first time. What I mean by that, a lot of y'all like these clean, pristine friends. They got these clean backgrounds. That ain't never had a problem, ain't never made a mistake. Ain't never fell down, ain't never been shamed, ain't never been embarrassed, ain't never been to jail, ain't never had a bad habit. I don't want no friends like that. You be talking about your clean record and how you ain't never had a problem and got a proper family and all of that. Well, don't hang out with me. Because if you ain't never been through nothing, I don't know if you can get through nothing. If you hang out with me, you bound to have trouble coming. I don't know how strong you are if you ain't been tested. I like folk with me that been knocked down and dragged through the mud and been talked about it, embarrassed and disgraced and shamed, but somehow God brought them back anyhow. Cause they the ones that know God can bring them through. Cause God already brought them through. You sitting up here talking about how much faith you got. You don't know how much faith you got till your faith been tested. You don't know how strong you are to when you got to stand by yourself. When the whole world turned their back on you and it's just you and God. And somehow down in your heart, he says, as I was with Moses. Let the world go on their way. I'll be with you when you make it. Just you and him. You don't know how strong you are till you've been by yourself. When I was a little boy, I started preaching when I was a little boy. When I was a kid, I used to preach what I heard the old preachers preach. They used to stand me on the box when I was a little boy. I got a little old. I was nine. I went on the road with Mahalia Jackson. They used to stand me up. I was too little to stand behind the pulpit. I had to be hiked up. But I was saying what I heard the old preachers say. I used to talk about how God would make a way and how God would deliver you. But I was saying what I heard. But I can tell you now what I know. I know him for myself. I know he's a way maker. I know he's a burden bearer. I know he'll dry tears from your eyes. Come on, 
I ain't guessing no more. Because I've had to call him and I know he answer prayer. I remember a few weeks ago, I went to the White House with Ben Jealous, head of NACP, and Mark Mariel, head of Urban League. And we sat there in the Oval Office with President Obama. Man brought me coffee in the White House. I thought about <laughs> sitting here with a black president, three black men and a black woman for black unemployed people. People never thought that day would come in, but God promised that if we be faithful over a few things, he'd make us ruler over many. If you just hold on a little while, he'd make our enemies our footstool. I remember when I, 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 I was not that long ago, I was leading a march. They'd kill a young man in the Bensonhurst section of Brooklyn. And I decided I would go out in that community and march for justice. For 29 weeks, we went out there every Saturday. They threw watermelons at us and called us the N-word. And on the 29th Saturday, a man ran out of the crowd, a white man, and stuck a knife in my chest. Two inches from my heart. They ran me to the Coney Island Hospital, and I, I remember like it was yesterday, I laid there on the gurney yes, yes. in the operating room. Yes. And I remember the surgeons was meeting and standing over me trying to see if my lungs was punctured and whether there'd be permanent injury. They never did tell me what the conclusion was. They knocked me out and had surgery. When I woke up, I was in recovery, laying there with intravenous in my arms and tubes in my chest and oxygen in my nose. I didn't know what the, what the forecast was or the diagnosis was going to be. And I remember as I laid there, I thought about how my mother told me that prayer changes things. I used to think that was just some old-fashioned stuff that mama thought about. But as I laid there not knowing if I'd make it or not, all I could do was think about as God was with mama, I believe he'll be with me. As I laid there, I thought about how rough it had been for my mother. And if God could bring her through, the same God could bring me through. My mind went back to when I went to college. We were talking about college in the back. I was the first one in my family that went to college. I thought I was a big shot. I got the big head because I was the first Shopton to go to a little college campus. So at first I was all arrogant. All of my friends on campus knew I was a preacher. And they said, Shopton, we want to go to church with you. And I, I kept stalling Radliff. I said, well, I'll let you know, but I really didn't want to bring them to church because I knew they wouldn't understand our kind of service. I stalled as long as I could. Finally, one day I said, I'll tell you what, I'll bring you to church with me this Sunday. I ran to the phone and called mama. I said, mama, I'm gonna bring some friends to church. I wish you'd be cool this Sunday. She said, boy, what you talking about? I said, well, you know how you can act in church. Mama had a little funny way of shouting. She jump up out of chair and kind of twist to the side and start jumping up and down. And I didn't want my friends to see mama shouting in church. She's all oh boy going about your business. We got to church early that Sunday. 
I didn't even sit in the pulpit with the other ministers. I sat out in the pew next to all of my college friends. Mama was across the aisle. She had on her best little suit. She had her best Sunday go to meeting hat on. She put a little scarf on her knees, trying to act all polished and sophisticated to impress her son's college friends. But halfway through the service, the choir got up and started singing one of them old songs that mama used to sing. And the more they sang, the more mama forgot about me and her mind went back she started shaking a little bit she started thinking about how she fed me and my sister after daddy had left us how we stood in the welfare lines getting welfare peanut butter in the little tin cans and the welfare cheese in the long brown box but somehow, some way, God made a way for us. She started thinking about how all of my friends went to jail, but she'd get on her knees every night and say, Lord, Lord, be a fence all around them and protect him every day and she lived to see me go to college and be somebody she jumped up out of chair leaned to the side and started jumping up and down yes yeah yes yeah i was embarrassed right if i put my head down all my friends was pointing laughing at my mother all of that week, they kept on teasing me about my mother. But as I laid there that night with all of that gear in me, I didn't think about my college friends. I didn't think about no professor. All I could think about is I hope somewhere somebody got to my mother and my mother was praying for me cause prayer 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 changes things yes yeah yes yeah by sunbreak by sunbreak I can hear in my soul something saying to me as I was with your mother I'll be with you hold on a little while longer yeah yeah about 7 30 that next morning the doctor and nurse came in I was laying there waiting on the diagnosis I said doctor tell me the truth what did the diagnosis say he said well last night there was emphysema all around there was phlegm all through your chest but we looked early this morning I don't understand it but somehow there ain't nothing on the x-ray everything 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 gonna be all right yes yeah while he was talking I stuck my right leg out the bed he said Reverend where you going you don't have to get up if you need the restroom we'll give you a bedpan you got those intravenous in your arm you got those tubes in your chest you got that oxygen in your nose you can't get up with all that equipment lay back down we'll get you a bedpan by that time my right foot had hit the ground he told the nurse make him lay back down make him lay down with all them tubes she ran over to lay me down but by then my left foot had already hit the ground i slid off the bed i leaned to the side and stopped jumping up and down yes 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 i know now i know now i know now 
while mama was shouting he walks with me he talks with me he tells me that i'm his own he been food when i was hungry he been watered when i was thirsty he's my rock my sword and shield my will my will my will in the middle of the wheel he's the lily of the valley the bright and morning star he woke me up this morning started me on my way yes yeah yes yeah somebody here today going through something i thought i'd come by to tell you like he was with your grandmama like he was with your mama like he was with those ahead of you he'll be with you hold on a little while longer in my life i've had to cry sometimes in my life i walked alone sometimes i've been lied on cheated talked about i've been mistreated i've been up i've been down i've been level to the ground i've been stabbed i've been prosecuted but through it all through it all through it all i i i i i i've learned i've learned i've learned to trust in jesus i've learned to trust in god through it all through it all i i i i to depend on his word he'll make a way he'll make a way he'll make a way yes he will yes he will yes yeah yes yeah when i came in i heard the choir singing i wish i could sing like that but god didn't give me that gift i heard the brother at the breakfast yesterday singing new songs i wish i could sing like that but god didn't give me that gift but sometime right left in the midnight hours when the phone stops ringing when the doorbell stops i go out in my living room all by myself and i sing my song i can't sing for men's breakfast I can't sing for Sunday morning worship, but I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. His eyes, his eyes, his eyes is on the sparrow. I, 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 I know, I know, I know. He watches me. Yes, yeah, yes, yeah, yes, yeah. Lord praise for Dr. Al Sharpton. Hallelujah. That's why we bring him and others like him because the media will paint one picture. But you need to know what's keeping a man like that standing. It's his faith in God. Thank you, Dr. Sharpton. There may be somebody here this morning that doesn't know Christ quickly. Maybe somebody here today who doesn't have a church home. 
My God, my God. The doors of the church are open. Welcome this young man today who comes to unite with us. Aren't you glad you came today? Aren't you glad you came today? Let's give it up again for Dr. Al Sharpton. Amen. 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 Let's all stand. Let's all stand. Oh my goodness. I want you to be in prayer. For Dr. Sharpton, I want you to, whenever you, whenever you see his face on television, pray for him. When you, when you don't see his face on television, pray for him. That God will give him the continued strength because we need a voice. We need somebody out there still advocating for civil rights. Amen? And so we're just proud, Dr. Al. Thank you for coming. You've blessed us. Our lives will not be the same. 
And we won't forget this day. Amen? Amen. Amen. Now may God's grace sustain you, keep you, protect you, undergird you, guide you. May his Holy Spirit do only what the Holy Spirit can do in your life. And may everything your hands touch prosper. Have a good week, y'all. Love you. See you next Sunday.